Hello everyone and welcome to Out and Equals last webinar of 2018 called How Younger Generations Are Approaching LGBTQ Workplace Issues. Thank you for taking the time to join us today. My name is C.V. Viverito. I am the Global Initiatives Manager here at Out and Equal and I'll be your moderator for today's webinar. First off, I'd like to make some technical announcements for all of you logging in or dialing in today. <clears throat> Just a reminder that this is a broadcast audio call from now until 11.30 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, so one hour. If you're using speakers or headsets on your computer, just make sure that the volume is turned up so you can hear us. And <clears throat> if you are having any technical difficulties, you can go ahead and chat them into the chat box and we'll try to get you taken care of right away. You can also use the chat box to ask presenters your questions as the webinar is going on. Please don't uh, wait until the end. If you have a question, go ahead and chat it in. And we're going to save it for the last 15 minutes where we'll have a questions and answer session with the presenters. If you are having problems signing in to your computer, just go to readytalk.com, click on join a meeting, and use the access code 6946521. Just a friendly reminder that the webinar is going to be recorded and it will be made available following the call. Also wanted to quickly highlight some of our upcoming events. As I mentioned, this is the last webinar of 2018 and the first webinar of our 2019 series is going to happen on February 13th. That information is going to be posted to our website soon, just, so just stay tuned for that. We'll also have some upcoming events such as our executive forum. It's going to be happening in San Francisco, April 17th to 19th. I'm going to share the link with you um, at the end of this webinar. And we also have our second edition of our China forum and our India forum. The China Forum is going to be happening in Shanghai in May, and the India Forum is going to be happening in Bangalore in August. That's very exciting as well. Next, I just want to start us off with a quick interactive poll. So you can see this poll populate on your screen. You can go ahead and click the option that best corresponds with you. And for those of you dialing in, the question on the screen says, according to your best estimate, what percentage of millennials or younger are employed in your company or organization? So you can go ahead and click that if you're on our web login. And it looks like the majority of you are clicking between 21 and 40 percent. The next highest coming in at between 41 and 60 percent. Very cool. OK, and there's going to be some of these polls uh, throughout our webinar uh, as a way to keep this engaging, so stay tuned for more of these. All right, with that, I would like to take a moment to introduce the topic and today's presenters to you. Today we're going to hear from three millennials about their work to advance LGBTQ inclusive initiatives in their workplaces in Latin America and India, and learn more about how they approach the issue. Uh, let me start off by telling you that <clears throat> millennials currently make up 44% of global talent, and by 2025, will make up about 75% of the global workforce. Some data from the U.S. shows us that 60% of millennials say it's important that the company they work for have a purpose beyond financial gain. And a 2017 follow-up study found that millennials who remain within a company do so because they tend to share the same values and are more satisfied with their company's social goals. <clears throat> our presenters here today absolutely represent that passion for ensuring that our workplaces are socially responsible and promote values of diversity and inclusion. So first we're going to hear from Neelam Jain, who is the founder and CEO of Perry Ferry. She is a 24-year-old social entrepreneur, and after two years of working with Goldman Sachs, she founded Perry Ferry a social enterprise that supports better livelihood and social standing for transgender persons in India through employment, entrepreneurship, and upskilling. Next, we'll hear from Tiago Marino, who is the customer success and adoption marketing, who is responsible for customer success and adoption marketing at Salesforce Brazil. 
Tiago also just finished up his time here with us in San Francisco as one of Out and Equals 2018 Global Fellows. He also leads his local employee resource group called Juan Ohana Brazil and is dedicated to promoting workplace inclusion through empathy building and allyship. Last but not least, we're going to hear from Tanya Blanco Cruz, who is the Codings and Construction Product Manager and the Latin America Glad Leader with the Dow Chemical Company. She's been in several roles at Dow for the past eight years, and in 2015, she, followed, she founded the Andean Regional Glad Chapter. Most recently in 2017, along with other organizations and allies, she founded Pride Connection Colombia, which is the first corporate network in the country committed to LGBTI workplace inclusion, now with more than 22 member companies. So without further ado, I'm going to welcome Neelam to start us off. Thank you, Stevie, and the Out and Equal team for this opportunity. And hello, everyone. Our organization, Periphery does, and how we have been working on this over the last year and a half. So as CV mentioned, we're a social enterprise with our focus on creating employment and business opportunities for the transgender community in India. And why exactly do we do this? Sorry. So um, if you take the transgender community in India, it's roughly about 1% of the country's population, which is about 10 to 15 million individuals. And the most common form of livelihood for this population is either begging or sex work. Um, so the perspective and the image of the trans community in India is uh, not as well, and there is no formal means of livelihood for most of the population. So at least about 60 to 70 percent of this population is either forced into begging or sex work, um, don't have access to any form of um, economic activity, to education, health, and a lot of those things. Yeah, and there are major barriers when it comes to family acceptance as well, because uh, the family also views the trans community only as a, um, as a part as not a participant in the economic activity. So uh, the suicidal rate is quite high. In 2016, a report mentioned that about 31% uh, of the trans population uh, attempted suicide, and uh, respectively for all the other cases as well. <clears throat> And when it comes to workplace, uh, we see that there is a huge resistance from um, small, mid-sized, and large corporates as well on onboarding transgender population, mainly with the view of how the co-workers might react and uh, you know, with the perspective and the image that lies of the transgender community. And overall, with the entire LGBT population um, in India, uh, a huge population still believes that LGB is a Westernized concept, and it it is it does not and it doesn't entail to the Indian roots. So there is a lot of stigma attached over there, and with the trans population, the stigma is with the perspective of the community. So, what have we done so far? So in our work so far of um, the last year and a half, we've, uh, we've helped about 60 transgender people at, uh, get placed into mainstream jobs. And this is across various industries and across various job roles. Um, we have also ensured that while we are placing people, we had to uh, ensure that the, the co-workers were sensitized. Um, and this wasn't just pertain to the people who were working with them, but also all the other touch points for the transgender individual, from the security guards to the all the other services staff as well. So we've been able to sensitize over 11,000 people. And about 30% of our clients have also started moving towards making um, inclusive policies with respect to uh, gender neutral policies, non-discriminatory um, action items, and things like that. Along with this, what we also ensure is um, to support transgender people if they want to start off their own business and don't just want to be in a workplace. So we help them nurture, incubate, and start off their own um, enterprise. So how have we been helping corporates so far? 
first is obviously through recruitment. Uh, we we act as a mediator between the transgender community and the corporates or the startups, and identify where they would fit in and help the companies onboard them um, with respect to policies and making infrastructural changes. And also, um, the most important of all is to create allies and active allies at that who can actively contribute in the organization and also in the larger society. So I'm just sharing a couple of examples here to give you all an understanding of the kind of work we've been doing. So this is with uh, the Australian New Zealand Banking Corporation. And what started off was a sensitization workshop for the leadership and the HR teams across various functions. And this was an LGBT um, gender non-confirming on the basis of sexual orientation, uh, what the sensitization took place. And the result of this, um, immediately it was the first time that the company uh, in Bangalore, India, uh, had onboarded four of them, four transgender individuals, and all of them came from very diverse backgrounds. So Panalakshmi, for example, uh, was previously involved, was previously a sex worker, although she was a graduate, and aspired to be in a workplace, but didn't have the right means of, uh, didn't, didn't have the right access to get into a workplace. And to onboard Dhan and Lakshmi and the others, the company ensured that they did thorough sensitization of all the other touch points as well. So she works as a, uh, all of them work in the services. Um, Hayati and Vanita are in the tech services. So our role here came, into, came in when we had to identify what the individual wants to do and give them that, uh, you know, align the passion of the person with what the corporate can offer and at the same time give the experience to the corporate um, you know, of a smooth and, uh, and, and a seamless process of onboarding trans individuals. So this is a local organization in um, India and one of the most popular uh, cinema theater group called the SPI Cinemas. So the SPI Cinemas reached out to us uh, just to run a sensitization workshop. But what happened in that workshop was, um, you know, it was quite heartwarming to say the least. So at the end of the workshop, we had a person reaching out to us from the group saying that, uh, you know, they've been facing some trouble and want to come out but don't know who to reach out to. So our trainer, who is a transgender herself, really comforted her and ensured that, you know, we made us, we created a safe space for her. And, and then eventually took this topic back to their organization itself. I mean, as in back to SPS Cinemas and told them that, here, look, we have someone within your own office who's come out to us and we need to ensure we create a safe space. And SPI obviously did that. And we had moved the person to another um, department just to ensure it was, uh, it, 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 uh, was a good experience for all of them. Yeah. And that workshop also resulted in a couple of other things. Um, you know, there were a lot more active allies who were created, people who started contributing, uh, not just within the workplace, but they started volunteering with Periphery, other organizations like Solidarity Foundation, and became active participants in uh, contributing towards uh, transgender inclusion, which was great, and also led to having um, um, all-inclusive washrooms. And which was a great step because it was the first time in the entire theater and the cinema industry in India that a theater made sure that all their restrooms, um, I mean, uh, restrooms at all levels, at all floors, had gender uh, inclusive ones as well, all inclusive as well. Yeah, and this is the testimony of the person who had come out and who just changed the name. And she mentioned that she's been hiding her identity for almost a year. And during the workshop, when she saw a trans woman expressing her raw self and opening her experience, it gave her a sense of courage, and that's when she felt safe to come out. All right, and the next one is uh, from a startup uh, that has grown quite rapidly over the last couple of years in India. It's called Nest Away. They're an online portal for uh, housing renters. So um, Nestle uh, and Periphery started working together mainly to create uh, 
a much more uh, robust diversity and inclusion strategy for them. So with respect to their policies, ensuring that all of their job descriptions, all of their HR notices were all-inclusive uh, usage of pronouns like they, um, ensuring that their forms weren't just male and female and transgender only, and all of those changes. So uh, Nestle reached out to us with that. Eventually what happened was the company realized that there's a huge potential, uh, huge um, aspect for them to hire transgender individuals as well. And uh, they had gone, gone back on recruit, I mean, they've gone on to recruit uh, five employees within their own organization. And again, it was the first time that a startup in India of that level had um, onboarded so many of them. And it's been about um, nine months now, and all of them are still, still successfully uh, in the jobs. Again, all of these five people came from various backgrounds. Just to give you guys an example of the two of them, Pujita uh, is an LLB graduate, which is um, which is majors in law. However, if you ask her what she was doing previously, she was uh, in the community system wherein begging and sex work was the only form of livelihood for her, and also there was no acceptance from her family. So she never got the mainstream exposure that she wanted to, and now she works in the legal operations of Nestaway. And then there is Rose, who used to work at, uh, who used to work and volunteer at various NGOs that work work for the sexual minorities. However, as a civil engineer, she wanted to explore much more, and she was a people's person as well. So this job finally gave her the opportunity to be a HR manager, and yeah, she's and she is really really good at that. So those are just some of the studies from our um, experiences with corporates and other startups. Just to tell you all a little bit about how our sensitization uh, engagement works, we've, we've kind of moved away from how we traditionally used to sensitize our audience. Um, you know, not just a lecture or a talk format. We try uh, indulging into various things, which so is give you some bit of an idea here. Uh, the, the areas that we're addressing is obviously fighting our own biases, whether it's unconscious or conscious. And the second aspect is creating more knowledge about the LGBT community, um, although it's, it's extremely tabooed within uh, India. And how do we do this? Is first thing is experiential learning, because it's extremely important for the audience, uh, especially in India, to empathize first. And that, that's how most of the people uh, here function as well, unless and until we empathize and, and we truly understand what uh, the issues are and, and why is it important to understand this, it becomes difficult. So we use uh, methods such as, um, 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 we use methods such as uh, thinking format, we use things like imagination to help uh, put people in the shoes of an LGBTQ person, and that starts off as a gateway to learning more. Um, second thing is group discussions and breakout sessions, uh, doing case studies, helping people solve cases instead of directly giving them answers. So this exposes them to things like uh, usage of pronouns, uh, how important it is to have uh, all-inclusive restrooms and the right policies in place and medical benefits and things like that. And the third aspect which we really love is the human library. So uh, we bring in folks from the community of some various backgrounds, from people who are could have been into banking and sex work to those who are in uh, mainstream workplaces. We bring a couple of them into the workplace and give that exposure to the employees to sort of engage with them and ask them questions firsthand. So that's, that's precisely how we've been um, sort of um, engaging uh, various organizations and then telling them how important it is and why it makes so much difference as well to, or to not just the transgender community or the LGBTQ community, but to the entire human race to be involved in, uh, in this. So that's about it from my end. And Sidi, I will uh, pass this on to you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Neelam. That was great. Um, before we move on to Tiago, we have one more poll here. And the question is, does your company have an LGBTQ ERG or BRG? So that's an employee resource group, a business resource group, or another affinity group. Um, 
Wow, so as the answers are coming in, it looks like the overwhelming majority, majority say that they do, which is great. Um, this is an interesting fact to know about our audience today as we hear uh, from Tiago about his work with Juan Ohana Brazil at Salesforce. So thanks everyone for answering that poll. Tiago, you can take it away. Excellent. Thank you so much, CV. Uh, well, I'm going to be presenting um, with you people um, today a bit of the project I put together with uh, the support of Alten Equal Fellowship Program, uh, which is a project I call here in Brazil and at Salesforce One Ohana, uh, building bridges with allies through empathy. Um, but before we get started, I want to say obrigado. Obrigado is thank you in Portuguese. I want to thank everyone to take the time to be here to join the session and also the Alpha and Equal team and to be here taking the time to listen and participate with us and hearing about our project. Uh, moving forward with my presentation, I would like to start sharing a bit of the vision, right? What's behind of the, this project they put together for Salesforce Brazil. The, the ultimate goal um, of this program is to put together a set of events here in the office focused especially on allyship promotion throughout the employees of Salesforce Brazil to cultivate the quality champions and a more inclusive workplace. What do I mean by quality champions? I'm talking about the people that participate in our conversations, in our internal events, that um, understand uh, where we are coming from as LGBTQ employees, right? Um, and this work is mainly based on the values of trust and empathy. That's uh, what guides the work of this group that we put together here in the office in Brazil, aiming to find common ground among its participants and learn together um, from each other, right? And when I, when I say find common ground, not only between the different groups. Here in Brazil, we have different uh, Ohana groups. It's what the name we use at Salesforce for the, our ERGs. But also with the people that do not, do not, is not participating in any of them, right? How do we connect not only between the groups, but also with the others, uh, with the others from the office, right, and engage them? and bring awareness and some knowledge, and, and we share and learn with them, right? So we thought together on values. Uh, we, this is a type of framework we use at Salesforce. We call it b 2 uh, I'm going to just be sharing with you a bit on our vision, our values, and some of our methods to, to make this uh, work in Brazil. The first of them is empathy and respect, right? Because we understand, we, we believe that uh, to promote an inclusive atmosphere of empathy and respect um, through events with employees, especially allies, right? To demonstrate how relevant diversity and inclusion are for the people and the business success. Uh, the second uh, set of values which, which are very important to us is trust and inclusion, because this group aims to promote the culture of transparency, psychological safety, and trust in which every employee has a voice and is heard, right, is able to work as one group towards common topics that impact their lives. Sorry the title here. Uh, and give back, right? Volunteer work and engagement beyond the company is one of this group goals. Uh, to be aligned to our one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one model. One-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one model is what Salesforce is, a, is an internal um, initiative that Salesforce embraces uh, of sharing, uh, of giving back. Right? And we dedicate 1% of our time, 1% of our product, and 1% of our equity to, to the community. Right? So this set of values um, were the ones we put together to guide the Salesforce team towards this project uh, development. Right? And how do we build our initiatives? Well, first we think of intersectionality. Here I'm talking about not only the, the LGBTQ ERG, but 
all existing ERGs here in Brazil working together. So we co-create, we collaborate with each other. Uh, we put together common challenges we have, and we will work them out through education and storytelling, right, throughout this event, which, which comes to our second uh, method. Uh, we believe that education approach fosters empathy and supports people learning and understanding. Hey everyone, this is CV. Uh, Tiago's phone just dropped, so he will be dialing back in in just a moment. If you can bear with us, uh, stay on the line, and Tiago will be right back with us. Hello. Hello. Sorry, my, my line dropped. Can, can anyone hear me back? You are back, Tiago. Take it away. Thank you. So education and storytelling. I was talking about that uh, real story matters, right? So each event, what we, we, what we are thinking here beyond intersectionality is each event we promote, we bring some educational content, and we bring together stories, real stories of people to support uh, that um, educational material we we'll put together for the team. And philanthropy, right? We always try to connect uh, our initiatives to volunteer work um, among the participants. Um, bringing, bringing some uh, information here about Brazil. In Brazil, we have four of nine groups, sales sports, Today, um, globally, has 10 of them, right, uh, with different types uh, of topics um, being developed uh, among the employees. Here in Brazil, we have four existing officially. We have Earth Force since 2015. We have Outforce, which I started here in Brazil in 2016. And also Women's Network. Women's Network is also a powerful group here in Brazil and started the same year as Outforce. Um, and also we have the Ability Force, uh, the group of people with disabilities. That's just born um, this year in Brazil. Uh, to finish up, I'm going to share a bit about the events we've been running in the office. Uh, the first one, it was very interesting. And when we launched the group and the initiative here, um, we invited a group of mothers. Um, and it's the first feature we, we, when we started this back in June this year. And the topic was family, right? We wanted to bring some educational material around allyship, why, why we were doing this all together, right? We wanted to connect with them. We wanted to bring some uh, more education to them around uh, LGBTQ topic and beyond that, right? So we started this first event together out for and Women's Network, the LGBTQ group and the women's group. I did this together with Luana. Uh, she's the leader of Women's Network here in Brazil. And it was very interesting because we, we, we did a little workshop with the team on allyship, and we invited this group of mothers to come and share their stories. This group of mothers I'm saying is named Mother for Diversity. Um, the interesting thing is it's a group of mothers in Brazil and they organize themselves very informally via Facebook. <laughs> I think they are now with over, uh, over 20,000 mothers. They, they, they organize themselves via Facebook groups and they fight uh, for the LGBTQ kids and also support each other as they, they run into different issues because Latin America, LGBTQ uh, community, 
um, it's kind of a um, sensitive topic here due to our Hey there, everyone. Looks like Jago might be having some technical difficulties. So while we wait for him to rejoin us, why don't we skip to an audience poll? Um, so while we're waiting for Tiago, there's a poll on the screen here that says, what stage of LGBTQ inclusion is your company in? <clears throat> and for those of you dialing in, I'll go ahead and read the uh, answer options. They are initial stage, less than one year, intermediate stage, one to three years, and advanced stage, more than three years, or you're not sure. Looks like we have most people saying that their company is in the advanced stage, being more than three years, and a pretty even amount of people saying that their company is in either the initial stage or the intermediate stage. And Tiago, do we have you back? Yes. Sorry, TV. All right. That's okay. I still you can to finish up here because I, I missed track the thing. Um, did you hear about the, the Mothers for Diversity? Yep, we did. Hello? If you can wrap it up within the next minute or so, then we should be Excellent. on schedule. Excellent. So the second event we ran in October, right when I came back from Altanifa, was coming out as allies, right? So here we had a larger group. Um, we made a workshop with the team as well. We had a greater number of participants, and feedback from the team was really amazing, pretty amazing. Uh, some highlights I put together here, uh, they gave us total score on that event and uh, some of the things they said, um, people from the office, right? Because it presented a very sensitive way, uh, the reality of people and how this reality is different from person to person. And this makes us wonder how we can be allies of different causes and revisit old beliefs. This here is because I put together a panel with uh, Gabi from now our leader for Outsource, also brought Luana to share her story uh, and represent the Women's Network Group. And we had Lloyd, the person with disability, to share his stories as well. That's why they saw uh, themselves as, lie, as allies in a broader perspective. Uh, second comment was uh, the event brought the importance of being allied to different causes, exemplifying how to be an ally, something that many people do not know how or where to start. This is something very common we hear around the office sometimes. And we are at a time that we need to foster and spaces to develop care and empathy with, with each other. Love it. So that's a bit of it. Um, and it's a wrap. TV, um, thank you once again, Obrigado, and sorry the issues we had with the line. <laughs> Obrigado, Tiago. Uh, okay, thanks everyone. And next and last but certainly not least, we're going to hear from Tanya Branco Cruz from the Dow Chemical Company. Thank you so much, CB, and thank you everyone for staying tuned uh, just to hear us out today. Thank you, of course, Aura Nico, for inviting me to this wonderful space. Um, I want to share in the next uh, 10 minutes my story and my journey in diversity and inclusion. Um, it all started for me in 2015 when I had the honor to be asked uh, to found and lead the GLAD chapter in Colombia. Uh, GLAD is our LGBTQ and allies resource group of the Dow Chemical Company. Uh, GLAD has been around in Adal for more than 15 years, but we didn't have a chapter in Colombia. So I was thrilled when I was asked to thrive and to implement uh, the vision of GLAD that was to foster an inclusive and a safe workspace um, in, in our country. We rapidly grew and we evolved uh, in 2018. We were already 33 members. That is the triple. We are a small office in Colombia. Uh, but it represented the 13% of the DAO employees and with a 91% of allies. Uh, we also had the challenge that we do not only have an office in Bogota, but we do have manufacturing sites, sites along the country. So it was a challenge also to integrate these sites. 
I want to tell you um, a specific action that we did uh, just to evolve um, our network into a, a more mature network. Um, I'm going to. I'm not going to go into detail because the majority of, of the people that are joining us uh, are mature networks. But I want to highlight some of uh, the key points that made us uh, successful. Uh, the strong ally strategy and me uh, as an ally um, really implemented the, the ally strategy and not only but the advocate strategy. Um, like Tiago said, uh, for us it's about empathy and respect. It's not only about an LGBT ERG, uh, but it, it's just to understand the other. Uh, respect is one of the core values. So uh, we really wanted to, to implement this um, in, in all uh, sites in Colombia. The manufacturing engagement, of course, uh, was a highlight of our, of our uh, success and of our history because it's known to be a difficult place to implement diversity and inclusion um, issues. So um, for us, it was a uh, thrill when, when we had success in the manufacturing side. You see the picture there of the Spirit Day celebration and just some dates that began to be uh, just key dates for, for all the Colombian people, like the Spirit Day celebration and the Pride Parade uh, participation also with, with the company. Um, for us millennials, of course, uh, social media is very important to us. So uh, the company um, Dow gave us uh, just green light to use uh, digital campaigns and Facebook and LinkedIn, the, the official uh, media channels that Dow uses, uh, just to speak out proudly about how our company supports and, uh, and um, includes people um, uh, from all sectors of orientation. Also, um, since we started uh, to evolve, we started to develop a strategic partnerships not only with uh, NGOs, but also with other companies. Um, these three pillars I want to talk about because I believe they were key for the uh, Columbia Cloud Network success. And it was the leadership support that we that we had along these years for younger generations to have inspiration and leaders is very important. And to stay focused on on or engage in the same company, you need to have inspirational leader and, and inspirational uh, role models. So a successful leadership depends on embracing diversity and just to be really inclusive. Also, an important part was uh, the Salesforce diversity training there, the standard barriers of uh, DAO in our customers, in our principal stakeholders. So we really wanted them to be engaged in the diversity and inclusion business case speech and to really uh, just grab DAO values and DAO the most inclusive company uh, in the world. So uh, we really want them to speak out to other stakeholders, not only internally. Of course, international events for us were um, a breaking point because uh, we started to see, uh, we started to open up our minds. Uh, I was able to participate twice in the Out and Equal um, uh, Forum in the United States. And uh, we had this year in Houston for the first time a 500 gathering, 500 people gathering in Houston uh, from all ERGs, just one week uh, of synergies of best practices sharing. So this kind of events uh, start open up your mind. And uh, as we start to sharing more with other companies and realizing that we were doing good, uh, not, not to be arrogant, but we, we were doing pretty good in, in terms of LGBT diversity and inclusion. We, we wanted to do more, you know. We are, we are somehow privileged to work in, in companies like DAO that support this and that have this integrated in their core values. Uh, so what else can we do? So this comes to the second chapter uh, of my presentation that is called uh, Pride Connection Colombia. 
I, I, well, I happen to be uh, at the right place at the right time with other people uh, from other companies just thinking about the same. Um, we got to the point where our ERGs were mature enough uh, just to start looking to how to how would we make more impact our, outside our companies. Other companies, especially local companies in Colombia, do not necessarily have diversity and inclusion policies or protection to the LGBT um, employees. So we started to, to think that it, it was our responsibility, not only to, to our society and to our country, but also to our companies, to start sharing more what we did inside, inside uh, our organizations to other companies that didn't have this, this policy. The importance of, of having diversity and inclusion um, uh, as a business case, uh, as an attraction and retention talent, as um, a synergy with other stakeholders. So we created and we launched Pride Connection Colombia on April uh, 2017 with just nine companies. Right now we are more than 23 companies uh, as, as organization members. Um, the first thing we did was to create the, the corporate block in the Pride Parade in, in Bogota. We didn't have a corporate block and it, it was very interesting just to see a bunch of, of companies uh, marching and celebrating the, uh, on the Pride Parade Day. Uh, last this year we had we had more than 300 people uh, from different companies um, uh, participating there. So huge huge success for us. We started participating in some uh, corporate events and forums from uh, other allies. But um, the main highlight that I want to share with you right now is um, the Pride Connection Colombia Summit. Um, since our audience was not only our own employees inside our companies, uh, but the other Colombian companies that might need a little bit more help just to getting started with the diversity and inclusion conversation. We gather 153 participants from the biggest companies in Colombia, not only in revenue, but in number of employees impact. Uh, so uh, we had for the first time a human rights campaign there in, in Bogota. It, we were thrilled to have them there because it was a huge reaffirmation of what Pride Connection Colombia mission was. Um, we also sold insider companies this kind of events as a customer intimacy event. Some uh, some competitive advantage that we could leverage to our co to our stakeholders like uh, suppliers or customers. Um, we had uh, almost 100% participation of our C level or presidency level uh, from all the company members. And since that event, we could um, sponsor some other companies, local companies. I had the pleasure to sponsor a steel company that just started uh, the conversation on diversity and inclusion. And we have had so much advance on what, what they are doing, not only in Colombia, but in, in other countries. Um, so another huge part of um, Pride Connection at Colombia is that we were redefining the concept, the concept of allies. Um, it is, of course, very important to have a straight allies in your ERGs, but you need to have other allies as your organization. And um, from my personal experience, uh, GLAD has given me so much purpose in my career at Dow. Um, I, I, of course, love my job, I love what I do, but GLAD has given that hint and that touch of purpose of, and of impact to society. And this is specific NGOs that are considered allies of Pride Connection and, and of our organizations just support our collective initiative. They have uh, a specific audience like children, like uh, transgender uh, people, uh, like education, or even public policy that we that we could support. 
um, uh, job hunting also. So these specific allies have been a huge part and a, and a big uh, part of this uh, success that we have had in, in Pride Connection Colombia. Uh, and for me, they have given um, an, an extra purpose because we, we impact society in ways that we have had not impact uh, only in our organizations. So um, this is it for me. Uh, hopefully we will get uh, some, some questions. Thank you again uh, for, for staying tuned with, with us and I'll go back to you, CD. Great. Thank you, Tanya. Uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Neelam, Tiago, and Tanya um, for your time and for your presentations. The work you do is really inspiring, and we all thank you for sharing that with us today. So we have about a little less than 15 minutes for some question and answers. Thank you, everyone, who typed in your questions to the chat box. I'm going to go through and select a few to present to our wonderful presenters now. Any questions that we don't get to, we will post next week in a blog post to be answered. So all questions will be answered um, by next week. <clears throat> the first question that came in that I'm going to pose to Neelam says, your programs and initiatives are very innovative. What, motivated, what motivates you to do this work, and how can companies encourage that same kind of innovation among millennials and among other employees within their own companies? All right. Um, so thank you so much for asking that question, and thanks, CV. So just to give you all some background, um, so I used to work at Goldman Sachs, and uh, while I was still working as a financial analyst in Goldman in India, uh, the company opened up something called as the Social Impact Fund, and they wanted the analysts across the across the globe to present any project that, was, uh, that would have social impact. And um, while most of them were working towards a variety of things from child rights, women, and all of that, um, I decided to create a case on uh, hiring transgender individuals within the organizations and you know, an entire proposal around it. So that was my way of uh, starting off my journey. And uh, although that project did not kick off within the organization, it, it did create a lot of inspiration, not just for me, but a lot of people around as well uh, to do something about it. And a lot of people started volunteering with a lot of NGOs and um, other organizations that worked with uh, trans communities. So I think this is a great way to you know, sort of uh, ask, uh, get millennials within your company as well to um, participate, um, open up impact projects, open up your social fund, uh, tell them that their ideas can be executed. So that's one thing. And another way would be to, um, you know, aligning your CSR activities towards um, volunteering in uh, LGBTQ-focused organizations. That's that. And personally, for me, I think uh, just the work itself is extremely motivating because at the end of the day, when, when um, someone from the trans community in India gets a job. It's not just purely or merely a job. It, it means a lot of uh, social respect, dignity, access to housing, uh, family acceptance, which wouldn't have happened previously when, you know, the way the begging or were in sex work. So all of these things uh, sort of inspire and motivate me. And seeing the people that I work with are filled with so much inspiration, and that keeps me going as well. So that's where I come from, and that's what drives me as well. Yeah, that's, that's about it. Perfect. Thank you so much, Neelam. Uh, the next question is going to be for Tiago. Um, since, uh, Tiago, you talked a lot about empathy building, we have a question here from Lucas that says, how can the younger generation connect with the C-level and older executive managers in order to foster empathy? That's a great question, Lucas. Great, great question. I think that uh, a couple of thoughts around that. I think the, the hardest piece here is to get their attention, right, and their engagement to participate with us along the way. One thing I can say um, that I did here in Salesforce, I invited them to be my sponsor, right? We have our country lead, which today is Renato Bizzola. 
Uh, and I had a very open and straightforward conversation and transparent conversation with him, I invited him to sponsor the initiative. And then you start connecting the pieces, right? You start sharing a bit of why you're doing this, why is this so relevant, and why this matters to you in a personal level. And you kind of start building that empathy and, and kind of understanding each other. I think it's, it's, it's an interesting um, starting point, right, uh, to get this conversation started. So um, the, 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 the challenge piece here is you have to understand them, right, where they come from, um, what, uh, what type of activities or, or, or level of um, uh, agenda of availab how can I say availability they have, right? If they have very, they normally, at least here in Latin America, I know C-level, senior management level, have very little time. So you need to be very specific and very um, transparent and straightforward of what you want from them, right? Once you, once you, you get them invited to join, uh, I feel uh, they, they, this connection start building up from that. I don't know if, I'm, if, I, if I completely respond to you, but that's what I would say. That's great. It's perfect. Thank you so much, Tiago. Um, Tanya, I would like to pose a question to you. Um, I know that Pride Connection involves working with a lot of partners. You've also partnered with some NGOs. So we have a question here from Carlos that says, who are the key players, not only within the organizations, but also in the country, to support the LGBTI initiatives? That's a great question, uh, Carlos, because um, when we were creating Pride Connection, we were defining what kind of allies we, we wanted to participate and what was our audience. And the government, uh, and policy was one of the great interrogation marks but because uh, our companies are, are really strict on, on not being attached to any party or any public policy specifically. But you do have a role in society and companies have a role in society and uh, you don't want to get caught uh, in, in um, you, you do want to be straight in your diversity and inclusion policies. So um, when we define government was a key player uh, and was an audience to us, but not necessarily uh, an ally. For allies and key players, we were more looking about NGOs uh, that really were um, respected and well known and that really had uh, a specific target audience that was uh, cor correlated with the target audience that Pride Connection wanted to have, uh, like future employees, that is universities and technical, uh, and technical centers, and um, of course, uh, current and, and, and of course, education was also a key player. So for us, it was NGOs that, that, we, that we wanted to have as allies, but we ended up also um, a, attracting some other uh, companies uh, like iQualis that were rating, uh, companies that rated uh, some diversity and inclusion uh, polls in, in Colombia that were also well respected and known. So uh, it depends on, on the, the target audience that, that you want. Uh, but yes, for sure, uh, government also plays a, a key role there. Perfect. Thank you so much, Tanya. Uh, we had a lot of questions come in, and I was going to leave some time for final observations. But what I'm going to do is we had a couple of different questions that were basically surrounding the issue of, what were some major challenges and how did you overcome them? Some questions were asking the major challenges in getting support from senior execs. Some were asking the major challenges in getting younger employees to be interested, um, not only in pride activities, but to be interested in the impact on cultural change. So what we can do instead, as for your final observations, if you all don't mind, um, you can perhaps take a two minutes each um, to just very briefly share 
one challenge that you experienced and how you overcame that or how you are overcoming that. Um, and then we can close out the webinar with that. Uh, if that sounds good, we can just go in the same order. We could start with Neelam. Um, Hey, Neelam, you might be on mute. So if you can hear me, you can go ahead and get started. OK. We might be having some technical difficulties. So we'll go ahead and start with Chiago. Thanks, TV. Uh, so we are talking about engaging people, right? Especially young people to join, and also we are talking about engaging C levels, right? That's that's what the question is about. You want us to share our considerations, right? Exactly. Just um, very briefly, we just have about a minute. But if you can highlight just one major challenge and how you overcame that, uh, I would say surprise them. Bring in also bring their reality together with you, the, with the things you do, with the things you are presenting. Not just present the LGBT context. Uh, only you, you try to find the connections with other people's lives and see, and you're going to see that conversations will shift from there. Once you establish that link with their lives, with, um, with their daily faces. Awesome. What about you, Tanya? Um, I'm going to uh, just link this question with Elliot uh, Cruz's question also about if I ever felt like some millennials were disengaged with GLAP's purpose. And I think that is uh, one of the challenges that I have uh, run into because sometimes, um, sometimes millennials think that we are already we have already gained the the fight you know that maybe these ERGs are not necessarily uh, not necessarily because uh, we are at that stage in our company where diversity and inclusion is very inherent. Uh, but then you give them another purpose like impacting society. And that is where a millennial or younger generations are more engaged. Sometimes when you get to the point where your ERG is mature enough uh, that the events become a little bit repetitive and trainings and, uh, and, and some other uh, gatherings, you just have to step to give them one more step outside your company and that's, um, that's the challenge I, we found when we were getting a, a mature ERG. Uh, we, we balanced it with the, with the price connection and the impact outside our company. So that was a right and a good way to engage more people, giving them purpose and giving them uh, the way to impact. That makes perfect sense. And it goes right along with all the data that says millennials are the most likely right now to say that it's important that they work for a company that have a social purpose beyond financial gain. So great. Um, with that, um, Neelam is experiencing some technical difficulties. So we will make sure to send her the question. And as I mentioned earlier, we will post it in a blog post next week. And we will send you all the email with the link to that blog post. So if your question was not answered, you will see it answered in that blog post by our presenters. I just want to take a minute to thank Neelam, thank Tiago, thank Tanya for sharing your wonderful experience with us. I think we all learned a lot. And of course, I want to thank all of you who dialed into our webinar. Uh, please do be sure to complete the short survey at the end of the call. That should just populate when you exit your browser. We'll also send it to you in an email. And just some very brief friendly reminders that our next webinar is going to be February 13th of next year. We also have the Executive Forum that's happening in April in San Francisco. There's the link to that event on your screen. And we also have our second editions of the China Forum and the India Forum happening in May and August of next year. So thank you so much, everyone. Be sure to take that survey. We really appreciate your time. And we'll see you in February.